بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين uh, As you remember before uh, Muharram break we started the last section of the book and that is about our relation with the environment anything other than human beings we already talked about animals and we had uh, very important discussions about animals now in this part we are dealing with uh, rest of environment of course uh, Gradually, we will divide this into different parts and for example, for example, we will have a section about air, about soil, about water, uh, so inshallah it will all come. Before we go into the headings of this part, here there is an introduction at the beginning of this part by Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli. And he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this uh, nature for our benefit, has made it available for our use and made it manageable by us. We have ability to use them to our benefit. But at the same time, it's a trust, it's an amana, and we have to use it properly and in a responsible way. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kahf, verse 7, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا We have made what is on the earth a source of beauty, zina, adornment. Why? So that we examine and try people. There can be different reasons and different explanations, but one reason is that this is used as a means for testing people. To see, ayyuhum ahsanu amala. Which of them are best in action? In the same way that Allah says, "Alladhi khalaq al-mauta wal-mauta wal-hayat liyablukum ayyukum ahsanu amala." Here also He says to test you who is the best in action, like death, like life. So we should not think that it is just a matter of benefiting, consuming, using, and na'uzubillah, even wasting, and damaging, and harming, and burning. No. Everything is made for wise reason. You can use it in a responsible way. You are welcome to use. It's a blessing. Allah has created for your benefit. But you have to be responsible. Another ayah in Surah Takathur that you are all familiar, Allah says, لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذَنْ عَنَ النَّعِيمِ You will be asked about all the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very careful about the way we deal with these bounties and blessings on the surface of the planet, inside, above, all of them. 
Imam Sadiq alayhisalam in a very beautiful hadith which uh, I have also put in the beginning of my paper on environment says لا تطيب السكنى إلا بثلاث Life would not be pleasant without three things. There are three major requirements of having a pleasant life in this world. These are things that even for our pleasant material, physical life in it. And of course, if you have pleasant physical life, it would help you with your spirituality as well. الهواء الطيب or الهواء الطيب if we take it at Fabayan for Salat or if we take it Khabar هواء so either الهواء الطيب or الهواء الطيب one is pleasant air if air is fresh it's clean is pure and it's with good temperature because pataya means pleasant can include all these things if air is so this helps our life being present number two to have abundant water which is azb azb means Again, pleasant, fresh, sweet. When a water is with good quality, we call it azb. In Farsi, we say govara. Ab govara. In Arabic, we say azb. In English, we can say uh, fresh, we can say sweet, pleasant. Number three. And fertile land. If the land is fertile, it can grow trees, vegetables, fruits, etc. Wheat, barley. So these are three things that Imam Sadiq mentioned. Of course, as we have said many times, these hadith that indicate numbers and involve numbers they are not said normally as a matter of exclusiveness that you know three and not four no but three are highlighted here so air water and soil these are three things that are very important about farming about planting trees about agriculture there are lots of beautiful hadith but at the beginning at the beginning just uh, we mentioned uh, one hadith from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then inshallah we will have more later and also i have mentioned some in my paper about environmental ethics in islam according to a hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ما من رجل يغرس غرسا إلا كتب الله له من الأجر قدر ما يخرج من ثمر ذلك الغرس. No one would plant a tree unless Allah will reward him proportionate to what fruits that tree is going to bear. In your lifetime, maybe some trees remain for generations. Any person in future is going to benefit from the fruits of this tree, you will be rewarded. This is how uh, beautiful is planting trees, making gardens, making farms that people can benefit from. And how also Allah is generous that consider this as a great act of worship, as a great act of service. And also it shows how much we have to be careful about preservation of nature and improvement of nature. 
On the other hand, we have many things about condemnation of polluting waters and wells and nature in general. Okay, after this introduction, now let us go to the first chapter about the environment. Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli here mentions a few important points. One of them is that in the same way that for our health, prevention is more important than treatment, and you should try not to become ill. Although, if you become ill, you have to go through treatment. You cannot refuse treatment. You have to try to find treatment. But the best thing is not to become ill, to live such a life and safeguard your health in the way that you don't become ill as much as possible, as much as is avoidable. With the nature also, we have to be very careful first about not letting nature and the environment to go into wrong condition. Pollution, I don't know, uh, eradication of the trees and forests and greeneries, excessive use, burning, all are things that we have to be very careful about them. And then if God forbid these problems happen like you know, there is fire, you know, we have to stop it. If there is dirt, we have to remove it. If there is pollution, we have to find a solution for it. So first, prevention and protection, and second, uh, treatment and recovery of the nature. This starts with your own home. Inside home must be clean then the gate and entrance to the home should be clean you know sometimes maybe people think that inside home is okay but outside home is not important but we have hadith about fena fena is the entrance to your home you know we have about Abu abdullah salam we say wa arwah allati hallat bi fena'ik fena'ul bab is just you know when you put your steps before entering that space which means like entrance to your home is also important to be kept clean every person should keep inside and outside their homes clean the public passage should be clean and as much as it is my responsibility i have to keep it clean if there is collective responsibility like uh, streets and you know places that it's not for one particular person so we have a collective responsibility to find people who can clean either city council or you know small villages maybe you know they can uh, hire some people or you know divide the task among themselves but we have to make sure that we keep everything that is uh, around us clean there is a general principle that Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli wants to draw from this hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Inna Allah tayyibun yuhibbu tayyib, nadifun yuhibbu nadafah. Allah is tayyib, Allah is pleasant, Allah is pure and loves us and everything to be pleasant, to be pure. Nidhafa means purity, cleanliness. Of course, in the case of Allah, it's not a matter of physical cleanliness, but it's purity. But what is amazing is that in Islam, purity of the soul, or you can say a spiritual purity and purity of the body or you can say physical cleanliness are very much connected with each other in general Islam very much brings harmony between body and soul between individual and society between this world and the hereafter these are th 
three major areas that harmony to the maximum are uh, wanted in Islam. So Allah himself is the maximum and the highest level of purity that you can imagine, purest of the pure. And he wants us in both our body and soul, in our physical environment and also in our human relations to exhibit this purity and this cleanliness. Physical dirt and a spiritual ugliness, both are condemned in Islam. For us, not only having moral problems is bad, but also having physical disorder and physical untidiness is also very bad. If we are going to live by Islamic standards, we have to be uh, the best people in the world when it comes to purity of the heart, purity of the intention, and also physical condition, whether it be well-being, being fit, being healthy, eating healthy food, keeping everything in order, uh, consuming very reasonably, all are part of our Islamic lifestyle. So, إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ يُحِبُّ الطَّيِّب Allah is tayyib. Tayyib means anything that you like, anything which is likable, pleasant. And He loves also things which are tayyib. Allah is nadif, clean, pure. يُحِبُّ النَّظَافَةَ he loves also cleanliness. And then Hadith continues and says, one requirement of this is to keep the entrance to your home clean. Not just inside the home. Even entrance should be kept clean. So this is a very important principle. Good fragrance also is very important. Not only good character, good akhlaq, but also good fragrance, physical fragrance also is very important. When you pass by a house, good smell should come from that house. So this is also something that, for example, we have about the conduct and seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Whenever the Prophet was passing by a place, even after him, people were able to smell good fragrance. And Rasulullah was very much loving good perfume and was considering spending money for buying perfume as a legitimate and recommended indeed expenditure. Of course, not like today that, you know, sometimes people uh, spent a uh, big deal of money, but something reasonable is not wasted and indeed is recommended to be um, spent. And then uh, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli says that we can understand that this is also not for only uh, per a particular gender, it's for men, for women, for children, for adult, for old people, for every person. Then he has a kind of interpretation of prophetic hadith about Mount Uhud. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a famous hadith is quoted as saying, Hada Uhud, he pointed at the Mount Uhud. Some of you who have gone to Medina, uh, you must have visited the Mount Uhud where people go to visit the martyrs of Uhud, like Hamza Sayyid al um, You know that before Imam Hussein salam, was killed, uh, Sayyid al shuhada was a title for Hazrat Hamza. And some other people who were martyred in that battle, of course, some of the people who were injured were taken to Medina, and those who died, they are buried in Baqi. So martyrs of Uhud, who died the same day are buried there. Anyway, when you go there, there is a mount there. You would see a hill, a mount. 
Rasulullah according to this hadith said Hadha Uhud Jabalun Yuhibbuna This is Mount Uhud This is a mount that loves us وَنُحِبُّهُ And we love it First look at the Prophet's beautiful way of respecting even something which may not look as you know a living being something which has understanding you know we may think oh this is mount this said you know just some you know soil and sand you know but for Rasulullah everything is sacred everything is important and respected we know how much Rasulullah respected even little furniture that he had in home. Everything in Rasulullah's house had a name. If he was using a container that had a name, if there was, a, I don't know, little, for example, uh, mat to use, it had a name. His, uh, for example, camel had a name. He respected everything. Now, he says, this mount loves us and we love it. And then Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli as a mujtahid, as a faqih also, uh, because we cannot make such uh, interpretations unless we are familiar with the entire rulings of Islam and the methodology. But he as a mujtahid says that maybe we can understand from this that it is not only Jabal Uhud, Rasulullah is talking about this mount as an example. Otherwise, Rasulullah and every Khalifatullah loves all the mountains and all the hills, and we should also love them. So, of course, maybe some people say we cannot understand it with this from this hadith, but in general, of course, it's very clear that any creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let alone these mountains which Allah refers to them as signs of his creation in the Quran nusibat, we have to respect them we have to love them we have to make a personal relation with them when you pass by a mountain a river an ocean or a garden you should recognize in them something unique and you must you know uh, make a personal connection with them you should not think that oh this is you know one of millions and you know these are mass produced they are not important you know how when you make a little thing it's very important for you which must be important I don't say it must not be important for example you make a painting it's very important for you you plant a tree it's very important for you then this forest is not important this mountain is not important. Everything that Allah has made for a lover of Allah is important. If you pass by a garden that your grandfather has made, you feel very much connected to that. You feel there is a personal relation with that. You think that you must respect all the efforts your grandfather made and put so what about things that Allah has created? So we have to have such attitude towards mountains and other th things in the nature. But on the other hand, those who are not acting as Khalifatullah, as vice chairs of Allah on the earth, when they go to a place, instead of showing respect and trying to preserve and improve, they damage. For example, in Surah Nahl, verse 34, there is this ayah that you are all familiar that maybe you didn't take it to this level, but uh, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli says that we can take it into this level as well. إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا وَجَعَلُوا عِزَّةَ أَهْلَهَا أَهْلَهَا أَذِلَّهَ In the story of, you know, Prophet Suleiman and the Queen of Saba. There is this famous ayah that when the kings enter a village, they make it corrupt 
وَجَعْلُوا أَعِذَّةَ أَحْلَهَا أَذِلَّهِ And they up, make the society upside down. Those people who had honors, when they attack a village, a town, a civilization, they bring them down. They humiliate the people who had honor. If, of course, this is about unjust people when they, you know, try to invade other countries and then they do this with those countries. So one of the things that Allah says they do is afsaduha. They make it corrupt. Ayatollah Jawadi Amri says, this is something that people who don't act as Khalifatullah do with the nature as well. Not only they make the society corrupt, but they make the environment also corrupt. People who don't use environment properly, don't use water, soil, forests, deserts, mountains, oceans properly, they are also afsaduha. They are also people who corrupt, who damage. But Khalifatullah is the one that he tries to respect everything which is created by Allah and preserve them and improve them. Rasulullah was so much particular about these things that even when there was battle, and you know in battle sometimes unfortunately people compromise. First of all, battle is a bad thing and Islam, you know, loves sulh, as sulhu khayrun. Peace is good. War can sometimes be as the last resort just in order to bring peace, in order to uh, stop further, uh, you know, damage. But if there is a legitimate war, uh, still we should not allow ourselves to have exceptions about environment. We cannot say this is the land of enemy, so we can corrupt their, I don't know, greeneries, their water, etc. Or in order to win, we have to damage the environment. No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was addressing these issues before wars. And one of the things that he used to say is not to cut the trees, even the trees of enemies not to cut them. Only maybe in a very exceptional cases, if a tree, for example, is not cut, maybe more human beings are going to be killed. Otherwise, as a way of punishing enemies, as a way of, I don't know, weakening enemy, as a way of harming enemy, which normally people you know, may do during wars, no. Unfortunately, we see in the 21st century how people you know disregard uh, environment of others i don't know cultural and historical heritage of others innocent people places of worship uh, schools hospitals they bombard everything unfortunately but even at that time rasulullah sallallahu alaihi was asking muslim soldiers to be different to know and remember that if a war is legitimate, it has to be for the sake of Allah and with full commitment to moral responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities was towards, for example, innocent people, elderly people, children, women, and also environment. And then if we have observed the cleanliness and good condition and well-being of the environment, there are some blessings, some outcomes for this. For example, Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba uh, in a hadith said that if people observe few things, and he mentioned here these things, tarko zina, if people avoid fornication, وَكَنْسُلْ fina, And clean the entrance to their houses. وَغَسُلُ ina, And wash properly their containers, their dishes, and you know, things that uh, they use 
for eating etc majlabatun lil ghana it will bring richness it will bring more baraka more rizq avoiding fornication so this is something about morality and spirituality and as i said in islam moral side and physical side come together then imam says and making the entrance outside your home clean and also washing properly uh, the dishes and you know plates and containers that you use Imam Sadiq salam also said ghaslul ina wa kashul fina majlabatun lirizq if you clean the containers and clean the entrance to the home they bring risk also Imam Raza salam said kansul fina yajlibu rizq if you clean uh, outside home as I said this is mentioned in several hadith it would bring risk then there is a heading about harming and polluting uh, the environment uh, for example about uh, you know if someone needs for example to uh, comfort himself you know for example needs you know to go to a toilet should not say okay and now I am you know in the jungle or the next to a river there is no one seeing me so maybe I can comfort myself here we have to be very careful and avoid polluting the nature and especially about trees that are bearing fruits about a river these public path passages we have to be very very careful then Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli has a discussion about the impact of sins on destruction of environment this is where unfortunately modern culture uh, is totally unaware and unfamiliar unfortunately not people because alhamdulillah there are many people in modern societies who have this understanding they have religious backgrounds cultural background but unfortunately modern and postmodern culture this materialist liberalist culture unfortunately doesn't pay attention to the moral side that much to the spiritual side that much if they pay attention Nowadays, unfortunately, even some of them, they don't pay attention to the global warming and the environment, etc. But if they pay attention, it's just the physical side. But for us, uh, the moral and religious side is very important. Uh, in the same way that polluting physically nature is damaging, if we have immoral lives, if we don't observe piety, this also would damage the environment which is surrounding us they are harmed with our disobedience with our sinful life as they are harmed by our lack of care towards their well-being so Ayatollah Jawadi Hamuli here explains that how uh, oceans and the lands and the seas can be affected by sins of human beings and he refers to this ayah 30 of Surah Shura وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ When some calamities happen to you in this public worldly life, it's because of what you have done. So if there is something as a general calamity, then we have to see what general responsibility we might have failed to observe of course it doesn't need every person to be involved or every generation to be involved or every city to be involved but we as humanity maybe previous generation maybe people in another city when people in a large city for example put their waste into river not only they suffer 
people who are using later down the river the water they are also being harmed maybe actually they harm more but as humanity it's us that we are doing this to ourselves so we have to be very careful about the way we live and we affect the environment for ourselves for our children grandchildren and for other human beings and also for animals and birds just yesterday i you know heard on the news that uh, if i am not mistaken a two third of natural environment has been damaged by human beings in the last you know recent decades two third of wildlife some uh, species of animals and plants have been damaged by human beings and eradicated by us just over you know a few years Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam quotes from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when zina, when fornication becomes public, people may have always had some bad practices. Maybe in the course of history, some sins were there, but very private with embarrassment not to uh, try not to un anyone understand what is bad in our society today is that certain things have lost their uh, sensitivity people uh, feel you know proud and or at least you know okay that they are committing such things so Rasulullah, according to this hadith, said, إِذَا ظَهَرَ الظِّنَا If fornication is ظاهر, is apparent, is public, or ظَهَرَ in the sense of it's dominant, is a spreading. كَثُرَ مَوْتُ الْفُجْعَةِ Then unexpected death also becomes a lot. People would die a lot unexpectedly before the real deadline their ajal comes or wa or when people do tatfif they sell less than what they have to uh, give so for example uh, you know quran says i say you know for example this is 10 pounds per kilogram and I give less and it can include any person who gives less than what he's paid for maybe it also is for employees that work less than the hours that they have to work so if this becomes you know abundant it's this is increasing then calamities in the form of uh, famine and shortage also would become more. وَإِذَا مَنَعُ الزَّكَاةِ مَنَعَتِ الْأَرْضُ بَرَكَتَهَا مِنَ الزَّرْعِ وَالثِّمَارِ وَالْمَعَادِنِ If people don't give zakat, then the earth also would deprive them from uh, barakat in farming and in the mines. وَإِذَا جَارُوا فِي الْأَحْكَامِ and when people do zulm in the rulings and in the judgments or in the governance and cooperate over zulm and uh, disregard their promises and their treaties then Allah would make people who are their enemies dominant over them. وَإِذَا قَتَعُوا الْأَرْحَامِ جُعِلَتِ الْأَمْوَالِ فِي أَيْدِي أَشْرَارِهِمْ This is also very interesting. When people disconnect from their kinship, they do قَتْعِ رَحِمْ Then money will be in the hand of bad members of the society. So قَتْعُ الرَّحِمْ would send away money from them. And then bad people have money and they misuse money against people. 
واذا لم يامروا بالمعروف ولم ينهوا عن المنكر ولم يتبعوا الاخيار من اهل بيتي سلط الله عليهم اشرارهم فيدعو اخيارهم فلا يستجاب لهم if they don't do amr ma'ruf and nahi munkar if they don't follow the chosen the good ones among ahlul bayt then allah would make their ashrar their vicious and wicked people uh, dominant and then even good people among them akhiyaruhum they pray but the prayer would not be accepted so this shows that even our moral spiritual religious misbehavior has impact on the environment and on the benefits that we can receive from the environment then the final heading for this uh, part is about fire if god forbid fire uh, breaks and uh, out and there is you know fire we have to extinguish fire uh, unfortunately right now that we are talking uh, there are uh, you know many many uh, acres of land being burnt in some places in the world this is a catastrophe this is a calamity this makes heart you know full of pain that these trees and these animals and birds and wildlife they are all are damaged human beings are suffering so we have to do our best to avoid such things and when they happen everyone should help to stop this because this is another way of damaging the environment but also here there is a spiritual point by Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli which is our last point for today and that is about this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam إذا رأيتم الحريق فكبروا فإن الله تعالى يطفعه when there is fire say Allahu Akbar and Allah is going to extinguish the fire then he has here a discussion about what does it mean to say Allahu Akbar. Is it just we do nothing and we say Allahu Akbar and then all of a sudden the f uh, fire will be extinguished? He says, no, the meaning of saying Allahu Akbar is to be real muwahid, true muwahid. If you are true muwahid, then your practices your ideas your collaboration your lifestyle everything would stop fire taking place and if god forbid accidentally something happens with this monotheistic approach you will receive the help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with your wise behavior under allah's help you can extinguish any fire anything that is going to burn human achievements or human investments or natural resources so it's not that only ibrahim السلام, was saved from fire when he was thrown into the fire every real muwahhid everyone who follows the tradition of abraham he would also be saved from fire of dunya and fire of akhirah inshallah we talk in the next week about air water and soil alhamdulillah rabbil alamin